students. Welcome back to Lecture 5 on Cantos 3 to 8, Upper Hell, Part 1. We're going to go through limbo, lust, gluttony, greed, and prodigality today. Let's get started. So, we talked about Cantos 1 and 2 last time, and so we arrived to 3 today. The gates of hell, sometimes called the vestibule of hell, and we see very famously up there, not from our translation, but from a more famous translation, abandon all hope, ye who enter here, of course, in our translation, line 9 of Canto 3 says, no room for hope, you who enter here, which is, we thought, a little bit weaker. Who we find here are the so-called indecisive angels. Remember, they're on the outside of hell, just like they're on the outside of heaven, because, well, neutral comes from the word neuter, which means neither, and, well, that's who will have them, these neutral angels. Will the fallen angels in hell have them? No. And neither will those in heaven. They have no place because they never took a stand. They never took a place. And so, well, they are forever consigned to being just outside of hell and forever nameless in their multitudes. Now, they are also considered cowards. Cowards, why? Because they didn't take a stand. Because they didn't take a risk. And because of that, they were made forever nameless. In fact, there, there was a retelling of the Iliad many years back. There was a terrible movie called Troy. And a quote that many students will bring to me that lets me know they haven't done their reading for the Iliad, but they have looked on the internet for quotes, is, is um, Achilleus looking at a young man, this Brad Pitt. And the young man says, oh, you must be scared, something like this. Uh, I would never go out to fight that man. And he's about to fight some giant, highest the greater looking guy. And the Achilleus in Troy looks at him. That's why your name will never be remembered. And so if you ever come across that quote and you see the Iliad, you know that's wrong. It's actually from a terrible movie called Troy. In any case, that seems to apply here to these angels. Because they don't take a stand, they don't get named. And that is their eternal punishment. To become nothing for all time. Which is a fairly scary punishment. Now, those who are also in the vestibule of hell, those unbaptized pagans, and, and those unfortunately unbaptized children who died, well, the punishment there seems to be, uh, well, excuse me, this is the punishment not for the children, but rather for the, uh, for the indecisive angels, because they are constantly stung by insects and endlessly chase banners, and also is very loud, wow, 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 like locusts are there. And so if we were to understand this not just at the literal level, but at the allegorical level, you might say that these bugs are a physical representation of their consciences. And the fact that their consciences will never let them rest forever for the rest of their existences. And just so you remember, there are four ways to read Dante's Divine Comedy. And we'll really, we'll really be looking at three of these. First one is the literal. You've got to know what happens. Easy. Sort of easy. The language can be hard for young students. Second is the allegorical. What does it all mean? That's something we're definitely going to be thinking about. The third way that I didn't mention earlier which I think we'll also be thinking about, but this is more personal for you. It's a moral way. What is he saying that you can apply to your own life, which is useful? Like, in this situation, is he saying that if two sides or factions arise amongst your friends, should you take a side? And so that's a good idea. And then there's a fourth that is even more personal for you. It's called the anagogical. It is how this story might give lessons for leading to heaven for a medieval Catholic. And so, you know... That's not something we're obviously going to focus on very much, because this is not a religious course. But that is a way that Dante thinks people can read his text. And so, I think that's very interesting. I do not personally read it in that way, but that is one of the ways to do it. Okay, remember then, in this third canto, we see our first river of hell, Acheron. And then we meet the ferryman of the dead, the first ferryman, his name is Charon. He does not want us to go across on his boat, because we have weight, because, well, we being Dante in this case, are alive. Living people aren't supposed to go to hell. However, it is the will of God, so says Virgil. And so Dante will go through hell. And Virgil will repeat this several times throughout upper hell. All right, good. Good, good, good. Here's Charon again. Good, good, good. All right, we make it to Canto 4, Circle 1, Limbo. We're not going to spend a ton of time on this, even though we really could. Because here in Limbo, we find those who exist without punishment. Well... It depends on how you define punishment, really, because there doesn't seem to be an active punishment. They're not being hit by whips, stuck in ice, burned by flames, cut in two. 
But they, as the unbaptized and virtuous pagans, that's what I meant to say earlier, are hopeless but with desire eternal, which means they forever, like Sisyphus, or not Sisyphus, excuse me, like Tantalus, are overcome with desire for something that they will never have. It's like they are forever on Christmas Eve, but Christmas will never come. How many of you know that feeling? It's Christmas Eve. Imagine you're 12. Tomorrow, you know you're going to get a bike. It's like a big present, and it looks like a bike. And more than anything, you want it to be when? Christmas Day, but it's Christmas Eve, and it will never not be Christmas Eve. Ooh. That's sort of like the feeling there, though obviously much, much worse. And so, there's a very specific place within Limbo that we're going to get to. There's a general area, and then there is a noble castle, so-called noble castle with seven walls. And in that noble castle with seven walls are several great people. There are four great poets who we will meet, who Dante will be inducted amongst, whom Virgil is a part of, making a fifth. There's Homer, Ovid, Lucan, and Horace. Horace is the only one who is not technically a, um, an epic poet. He is a satirist, which means he is very good at making fun of people. Um, as well as many great uh, characters from throughout history. You have uh, philosophers like Aristotle, Plato, and Socrates. You have um, even great commentators like Averroes and an another great um, Muslim thinker. I believe Saladin is down here too. People of note, great wise individuals from the past. Great poets, great philosophers, great mathematicians, great commentators. Very wise individuals. But what is it that they lacked? Well, what they lacked is a thing that overcomes all error for Dante. They lacked faith. They were not Christian. And so, as wonderful and as beautiful as their knowledge was, ultimately it was Fruitless. And that's a very powerful symbol in this circle because the noble castle in many ways resembles a garden. A garden very similar to the first garden that, uh, that Judeo-Christians would know about, the Garden of Eden. Except for the thing about the Garden of Eden is it's a fruitful garden. It's a garden that can lead to, to more. Whereas this garden, well, it's down in hell. You might say that these are the withered fruits. And it might also tell you something about what Dante believes a good life is. Apparently, you cannot just pursue wisdom for its own sake. Apparently, wisdom is not enough for a good life. One needs wisdom as well as faith. What does that look like? Well, we'll have to continue investigating. In any case, between circles one and two, Virgil and Dante leave lumb limbo, limbo and observe Minos judging the dead. I've mentioned this several times, but keep in mind that Minos, who was a mythological Cretan king, the first Cretan king of the Minoan era, we postulate, uh, and son of Zeus, and archetypal king of all mythology, remember that, A, you will see one of his sons down in uh, Circle 7, amongst the violent, the Minotaur, technically a stepson, and that he apparently has some serpentine tail now. He has a serpentine tail that coils around a rock and however many times it coils around a rock determines how many circles down you will go as a center. And remember, there are nine circles, so it can coil nine times. So you might say, why, why is he made to have a serpent tail? And I'd say, well, there's so much to say about that. But one thing I will just say is that in general, when considering both Greek and Judeo-Christian mythology, you will see that snakes often have a negative connotation. Of course, in the story of Adam and Eve, there is a snake was often associated with Lucifer in a tree who tempts Eve and gets them kicked out of Eden. Well, there's a very similar sort of garden in Greco-Roman mythology called the Garden of the Hesperides, which has golden apples on the tree and is guarded by snakes or a dragon. And only gods can go there to get these golden apples. Snakes generally equal sin or the devil or something bad in this case. You might also say... Mr. Schmidt, aren't snakes in some way associated with Athena? And I would say yes, in that that which gives you wisdom is often dangerous. Or that there is also a danger to acquiring wisdom, which links up very nicely with the idea that our philosophers are in limbo, are in the inferno. Apparently, wisdom is not necessarily only something good. Hmm, 
which is very different from how the Greeks and the Romans thought. In any case, that's what I wanted to tell you about Minas. Also recall what he tells us. What is he? He gives us a warning right before we go down into the true circles of hell, which is what? Do not trust anyone. Be careful who you trust down there. And don't trust anyone is a pretty good uh, thing to say. I would say that's not unintelligent of him to say. All right. We continue to move through Canto 5. So, yesterday we read Canto 5, lines 82 to 142. We've looked at the speech of Francesca. So we know that we are here in the first true circle of the Inferno, where the lustful are. And that they are blown about in a violent storm without hope of rest. And that the two main figures that you need to know from here, the, the one who speaks is Francesca da Romini. Remember that her story is, of course, that she was mar married to a, a man named Jean. He was slightly deformed. He had a very handsome brother named Paolo. Well, Francesca and Paolo became very attracted to each other. One day, they found themselves reading without any... Oh, I'm forgetting the term for it. What is the name of a person who is supposed to supervise you while you are doing things with somebody of the opposite gender? Uh, a chaperone. Very good. In fact, uh, uh, y'all as students, I should have said, who are, who are the people at the parties that make sure that they stay PG? Chaperones. Right. They didn't have a chaperone. They're reading this book. Ooh, apparently this book's a little body. It was a story of Guinevere and Lancelot. And as you recall, Lancelot was one of the Knights of the Round Table, the greatest of the Knights of the Round Table, very similar to Achilleus, to King Arthur, who would be more like Agamemnon. And Lancelot, or Guinevere, cheated on her husband. Arthur, with Lancelot, in the story that Francesca and Paolo are reading together, and they keep looking up at each other, and they keep blushing. And then finally... Lancelot and Queen of Fear in the book, they kiss, and then finally Francesca and Paolo, lips trembling, kiss. And then the very last line is, there was no more reading done that day. And thus the lustful, and thus the lustful students. All right, good, 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 good. Those are not the only ones we see down here, however. Those are not the only ones that we see down here. I'm not going to have enough time to leave you on this slide, just because I sort of told it now, and I appreciate, and I'm sorry for that. But a couple of the other people that we see, okay, yeah, this seems a little bit repetitive. Here are Dido, good, just go down to four here. Cleopatra, Helen, Antony, Marcus Antonius, and Achilles. Now, I just very quickly want to touch on why they're here. Dido, obviously she is here amongst the lustful because she broke her promise to Sychaeus to be forever abstinent and uh, chaste after he died by laying with, in a cave, uh, Aeneas. And then, you know, then they were sort of boyfriend-girlfriend for some time as Carthage uh, continued to degenerate or fail to grow. Cleopatra, very famous, very, very, very famous Egyptian queen, um, for many reasons, but two of the big ones why she would be here amongst the lustful is she took two Roman husbands, I say husbands with scare quotes, uh, during her time. One was the not-so-famous Julius Caesar, obvious irony there, with whom she had a child that she called Caesarion. And then next with Mark Antony, who uh, she actually had three children with, and uh, at the Battle of Actium actually caused him to lose that naval battle by, out of nowhere, for no reason, turning backwards and flying from the fight. And then he followed her, and then his forces collapsed, though he had the power to defeat Octavian. And so he was destroyed, and so was his military effort by lust. And Achilles is there because of a story that he fell in love, and this is a medieval story, not an Iliad story, that he fell in love with one of Priam's daughters named Polyxena. Actually, I think I have it here. There we go. You can write this down. Polyxena. And here's the idea. He set up a meeting, a tete-a-tete -tete with her, at a temple to consummate his love with her. Unfortunately, this was a trick. When he showed up, Deiphobos and Paris were there. They shot him in the heel, and he died. So supposedly after Ilion fell, Achilles shows up as a ghost. I believe it's Agamemnon, but it might be Odysseus. And he demands that one of Priam's daughters be sacrificed to him, and that daughter be Polyxena, and it's done. And Isolt comes from actually a funny story, or not a funny story, an interesting story that Chaucer actually 
first wrote about, also Shakespeare would later write about, which is uh, essentially a story of a young Trojan prince and his lover. Uh, we're not going to focus too much on that. In any case, these lovers and more have been swept up in the tornado of their passion, passion endlessly reaching for each other, yet eternally kept apart by the winds of hell. And so um, uh, another pair that we would add in here, had this been written later in time, would probably be Romeo and Juliet. You're seeing that these people who are lustful, it is not simply that they are lustful, but that their lust has consequences. In the case of Dido, hurts her people, and she ends up committing suicide. Cleopatra, she ends up committing suicide, and so does Mark Antony. In fact, she famously does it with an asp who poisons her. Because of her own deeds, her people, uh, they lose power, and Mark Antony's war effort falls apart. Helen, well, we all know she helped to destroy Ilion. Polyxena helped for the greatest uh, Cian, at least in the Middle Ages, to die. Achilleus and Isolde and Tristan end up dying at the end, too. So it's almost like the lustful end up what? End up dead and having ruined your life. And actually, this picture up here is, you can see the Egyptian hieroglyphics in the back. Obviously, which two lovers are those? The one who's Egyptian. Cleopatra. Very good with Mark Antony. Very good, very good. It's, I always like that they're sort of represented as asleep. It's like, it's like their intellects are asleep as they give in to passion. Huh. In any case, Dante hears this story by Francesca, and he's so sympathetic, he's so taken in, he's so fooled, he thinks. On to circle three, canto six. Blood. Ugh. You look at this, you see this gnarly, this is William James, or excuse me, William Blake, by the way, not William James. Uh, a very fantastic, phantasmagoric is what some people would say about this image. You have Cerberus there. You have a ugly looking Job of the Hut, sort of clown bear looking thing here. That's Shiako. His name means pig man. And so he looks like a pig man. He's the one guy you need to know from three, though I'm not really going to focus on him very much here. So we're about to get to three. Right before we get there, we run into horrifying Cerberus. Now remember Cerberus is the three-headed Guard dog of the dead from ancient Greek mythology. In fact, the twelfth labor of Heracles is to go get Cerberus and to bring him back to the world of the living. Remember that we saw him in the Aeneid, book six. The Sibyl had to throw a substance to him so that he would chew on it while uh, the Sibyl and Aeneas passed by him. Well, in this case, uh, it's a little more insulting. Uh, we see that Cerberus is being treated more like a demon, far less like a, a profound mythological creature. He has muck, mud, worthless mud thrown into his face by Virgil. And that's what it takes to get past him. Well, that's in some way significant because the punishment in this circle is for the gluttons to, who really love to indulge in comfort was, is to sit in the mud while hail constantly strikes them and Cerberus occasionally <laughs> mauls them. Huh. And you might say, Mr. Schmidt, what is the allegorical way to perceive that? And I say, oh, well, I think it's clear. Just as these people overconsume like pigs in life, so do they live in a sty like pigs in death. And just as they overate in life, so are they overeat in death. Did you have a question? Yes, sir. Uh, so what happens after they get mauled? Do they just, like, respond? They just sit there in pain. And you just, this is how you just imagine it. They sit there in pain until it's time to be put in more pain again. So, a question that's often asked, and you have to give a little bit of mythological consideration, just like remember when you're reading the Iliad, Achilleus had had a son ten years before, and then all of a sudden he dies, and then his son replaces him, and he's apparently just as old as he is. Or Odysseus gets home after 20 years, and he looks just as handsome as ever. Well, first he looks sort of old and craggy and hoary, but then he looks very like young and handsome and uh, has curls again and all of that. Uh, but with this, just always assume that the punishments are as bad as they can possibly be. That's, that's the idea. That there, there's no way to get comfortable or to get used to it. It's always as bad as it's ever been, which I think is a horrifying idea. And I think that's the right idea. All right. All right. Here we also get our first taste of Florentine politics. They're described sort of like pigs. There will be many, many references to the fact that the Florentines are, are decadent, a decadent people. They are, uh, they overeat. They're avaricious and greedy. They're wrathful towards each other. They have all sorts of sins 
the whole idea is that there are good people right now, or a bad degenerate people that are going to destroy themselves. Like the souls in hell. Obviously the latter, right? That they are a bad degenerate people. In any case. The buttons. You don't really, this is more of a repetitive slide too. Just remember, <laughs> to be gluttonous is to be excessive. To eat and drink too much. This is guarded by Cerberus. He's a three-headed god or dog from, who guarded the underworld in Greek. And the Contrapasso seems to be something like, just as in life they were consumed by their desire for food and drink, so were they consumed in death. The, the term Contrapasso. We've obliquely talked about this, but not specifically. It's an Italian term that means counter self or to suffer the opposite. Well, the idea here is that each punishment in hell has a, signa a symbolic significance. It's allegorical in some way. So how you are punished is directly related to how you sin, which makes sense. Makes a lot of sense. It'll make even more sense when we get to the purgatorium, where how you are punished is also directly related to how you sin. It actually helps you to get rid of your sin. However, here in the Inferno, is there any getting rid of sin at this point? No, there's forever being punished for it. So, cool. All right. Okay, the only thing I need you to know from here is that we encounter one character that we get to talk to. We're not even going to read what he says. In this case, his name is Shiako. If on a quiz, I ask you which man's name means pig, or obviously which circle would you find a man whose name means pig in? Know that it is the gluttonous. Know that it is the gluttonous. All right. Circle four, canto seven. Avarice and prodigality. Avarice means greed or to be a money grubber. In fact, if you watch the Jim Carrey, <laughs> the Jim Carrey Grinch, the Grinch will at some point be yelling about the overconsumption of the Who's and he'll say, the avarice. And you'll notice that now and you'll know what it means. It means greed. Prodigality well, that term comes from a New Testament story about the prodigal son. The prodigal son is a man who asks his father for his inheritance, and then he goes off and spends it all. So to be prodigal means to waste your substance, to waste your money. Know that avarice, a synonym with that is greed or greedy. Also to be money grubbing. Know all three of those terms mean the same thing. Know also that to be prodigal means to be liberal, to be free with your spending. Um... And modern-day conservatives would probably laugh about that. Uh, ha, 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 ha. In any case, the other term, prodigal, liberal, also spend thrift. Somebody who overspends as opposed to underspending. So these are two sides of the same coin. That's why, and in fact, they will be represented, the punishment, uh, in a Sisyphean way. The avaricious will be pushing boulders in one way around a semicircle. Semicircle means half circle. You say, why not a full circle? And I'll say, because the prodigal are pushing boulders in the opposite direction. Which is very interesting. I'm going to very quickly draw a circle here. Now, when we say you've made a 180, we say you've totally changed perspective. Because you've turned what? What's the preposition attached to that? When you make a 180, you've turned around. But when you get back to the beginning, after making that turn, you've come full what? Right. And so a circle is a symbol of a full perspective. In fact, if you ever become a sniper and you get into a bird's nest, that will be defined as a tower that has a 360-degree view, a full view of things. Well, the problem with th these people is they only ever make it half. So they only ever see their own what? Perspective. Perspective, right. And the greedy, just like the prodigal, only ever see their own what? Perspective. So what do they never see? The other perspective and therefore the what? The full circle. The full truth, right. These people's problem is that their greed and their prodigality blinded them from the truth of the fact that their lives were meaningless and that they lived for something that is essentially useless if that's all you live for. Because the idea behind money is it's a tool, a tool to be used for 
good ostensibly. Not that it is something that you acquire or spend just for itself. And I would say that we still believe that. We still have famous examples of people who are greedy or avaricious. Scrooge, for example. How many of y'all watched A Christmas Carol? Some Christmases or most Christmases, whether it have ducks in it or Disney or like, uh, what's his name, Mickey. Or there are many, many examples of greedy people. People who overspend, uh, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know that I can imagine a famous character immediately that I know about that. Hmm. I'll have to think about it. In any case, somebody I should have mentioned. Right at the beginning of this circle, just like at the beginning of the third circle, just like at the beginning of the second circle, we run into a Greco-Pagan, or a Greco-Roman pagan figure. We ran into Minos and Charon before the first circle, or excuse me, before the second circle. We ran into Cerberus before the third circle. Now we run into the god of wealth, Plutus, sometimes uh, uh, conflated with Pluto, who is the god of the underworld in Roman mythology. And he's babbling nonsense. He says, Pape Satan, Pape Satan, Alepe. Some people think that that might be Father Satan, Father Satan, help me. But the idea is it's a confused language that doesn't mean anything. Well, that makes sense. Because if you think about what's being punished, the sin in this particular circle, the whole idea is that these people lived for nonsense. They didn't understand why they lived. To live only for money is to live an unintelligible lifestyle. Hmm. Hmm. Ooh, that's pretty big. And so, oh yeah, I even give you another term here. So those who are avaricious or greedy are sometimes called misers. Uh, the best definition of to be miserly I've ever heard was given by Oscar Wilde, which perhaps you've heard it before. Uh, to be a miser means to know the cost of everything, but the value of nothing. Which is interesting. I think that accords nicely with the unintelligible nature of what uh, Plutus says. That if all you do is live for money, what do you understand? Potentially nothing. And so misers are generally called cheap and hoard their money tight like Ebenezer Scrooge. And then spendthrifts are people who overspend, spend too much money. Very good. Very good, very good. Good, good, good. Here's another picture of them doing what they do. Hmm. <laughs> okay, actually, that's all we need to do for today. Let's quickly recap. We went through limbo today. In limbo, we talked about several major figures. The ones that you need to remember, especially, are the four poets who invite Dante into their ranks. You remember the philosophers Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, but the four people you really need to know are Ovid, who wrote the Metamorphoses, Homer, who sang the Iliad and the Odyssey, Horace, who wrote the Ars Poetica and the Satyrion, I believe it's called, I've never read it, at this point, probably need to make some time to do that. And Lucan, who wrote a very famous Roman epic called Pharsalia, which was about the civil war between Pompeius Magnus, Pompey the Great, and Julius Caesar. Second circle, the lustful, you need to know about Francesca and Paolo. Make sure that you know about some of those other famous lovers too. Helen, Cleopatra, and Mark Antony. Polyxena, perhaps no Tristan and Assault for bonus questions. Uh, as well as, remember that Achilleus is down there amongst the lustful, and remember that story about him and Polyxena and his lust leading to his demise as well. Circle three, guarded obviously by Cerberus. He has uh, dirt thrown into his mouth, and we have several people being pelted by mud and occasionally being mauled. We have a pig man now, down there named Chiaco. And then in the fourth circle, remember that it is split into two. Those who are greedy, go through one part of the semicircle, pushing heavy stones like Sisyphus, and those who are prodigal go through the other part of the circle, pushing the stones. And so we've seen those who are tantalized, who have desire without hope in the first circle. We've also seen those who are very much like Sisyphus in the fourth circle, recreating two of the ancient Greek punishments that we saw in Tartarus last year. We heard about them both in Odyssey Book 11 and saw them in Aeneid Book 6. So you can see that this encyclopedia contains, well, a lot of what had existed at the time of Dante. Let's start Lecture 5, Cantus 3 to 8, Upper Hell, Part 1, Limbo, Lust, Gluttony, Greed, and Prodigality. We are going to do the vast majority of Upper Hell today. Be ready to move fast. So Canto 3, we get to the gates of the hell, also called the vestibule. 
of hell. That's a fancy Latinic word for gate. Gate obviously being related to the Old English. Inscribed there on that <laughs> allergy stick. Inscribed there on the gate to hell. On the first nine lines of Canto 3 is a very famous quote. In fact, this is line 9 itself. It is, Abandon all hope, ye who entered here. You'll notice in your translation, they don't have that nice verbal form, abandon from the Latin, or excuse me, the Italian lasciate. They have no room for hope, you who enter. Charles Sisson, not the most poetic guy when it came to that line. In any case, what sorts of people, or what sorts of souls, what sorts of sinners do we find here in, or right outside of the gate of hell? Well, we do find a certain sort of person, but it's not a person at all. It's the indecisive angel. The, the, the angels who were neutral. They were neuter. And remember what the word neuter or neutral means. It means neither. So they chose neither the side of God and the angels that would stay on high. They neither chose, or nor did they choose, the side of Lucifer, the fallen angels. And so for all time, they are neither nor, and they will never be known. Their names are unremembered, just like someone who never takes a stand. Now something interesting here. Their punishment. Besides the fact that they are nameless for all eternity, as if they never even existed, is that they are stung by insects incessantly. This is based almost certainly on the punishment of Io by Hera, who was one of the lovers of Zeus, who had a gadfly. Who, whenever she had a moment of rest, a gadfly is like a horsefly, uh, like a very stinging bite. She would get bit by bit by it. And so I told you that there are four ways to interpret Dante, but that we're mostly going to focus on two. I'll tell you those two, I'll tell you the other two very quickly, and then I'll tell you what I think this means, and you can tell me whether you think that's right. The literal level, the first level you read Dante at, the narrative level. Insects are biting neutral angels for all time. Very uncomfortable. Now the second level, does anybody recall the term or the symbolic way to understand Dante? It is the allegorical. Well, symbolically speaking, what could it mean that these, these spirits, these angels, are forever accosted by bugs that are biting them and are very loud like locusts? I don't know if you've ever heard locusts, but they're wow, wow, cicadas, too, wow, wow. And so they don't ever have a moment's peace. Well, the allegorical way to understand this might be that something is for all time eating away at these characters at these angels. It's almost like it is their conscience that will never let them rest. And you might say, Mr. Schmidt, do you have evidence from wide-ranging literature across time and space uh, to give as evidence for this? And I would say, absolutely. Think of Theodore Dostoevsky. You'll read him as a senior. You'll read his brother's Karamazov. Well, in his Crime and Punishment, there's a man who has good reason, Raskolnikov, for killing an old woman. She has money that she doesn't use. She's sort of abusive and mean. She, uh, if he does not kill her, Raskolnikov will not get the money necessary to keep his sister from a terrible, almost prostitute-like marriage. He seems to have, in his own mind, pretty good reasons for taking her out. And yet, even after he does, can you guess what he feels and cannot escape from? Guilt. Guilt, of course. Well, how many of you have ever read anything by Edgar Allan Poe or heard of him? An American Victorian Romantic poet. Romantic poet, really. Well, he wrote a work called The Telltale Heart. A man commits a murder, gets away with it. And then he hears boom, 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 a heartbeat beneath the deck. Does he literally hear a heartbeat? Or is that the sound of his own conscience never letting him rest? It seems so. It seems so. And so this is not an abnormal way to read. The other two ways to read Dante. These are personal ways, as far as I'm concerned. One is moral. Do you look for advice from Dante? Occasionally I'll mention a potentially moral way to interpret something he says, especially when we get to the purgatory. The fourth way is very strange. It's called anagogical. It means lead you above. You can read this, if you don't think Dante's a heretic, as a step-by-step -step guide for making it to heaven. That obviously is not something I'm going to focus on because I'm a teacher, not a clergyman, but that is something, uh, that, is a, that is a way that Dante claims you can read his story as a handbook. So that's obviously not going to be our focus, but it is something that he says. All right, in any case, we then see 
Charon, and he takes us across the river Acheron. That is the first of four rivers in the Inferno. He complains to us about the fact that we have weight, tries to send us away, but Virgil does what he will always do with these Greco-Roman monsters and deities. He denigrates them. That means he reduces their reputation, treats them with scorn. Charon, he's going to say, it's willed by God, you're going to let us do this. Minos, don't bother with your breath, we're going to cross. Uh, then we're going to see um, Cerberus, uh, don't bother with your breath, we're going to cross. Then Plutus, don't bother with your breath, we're going to cross. Phlegias, it is willed by God. We will cross, and then we'll see some fallen angels. It is willed by God, and then we'll meet some crazy creatures called the Malabronche, and they're going to be kind of deceptive. The whole idea being Greco-Roman monster or god is greater than or less than Catholic Christian god of Dante. Less than. Over and over and over again. Very good. All right, Canto for Limbo. I am sorry that I am not going to spend more time on Limbo with you. It certainly deserves more time than I'm going to give it. But what sort of people do we find here in this named circle? They are the unbaptized and the virtuous pagans. Unfortunately, this is where those little children who were not baptized do go for Dante. We will see some children also who get faded into heaven, but apparently the reason is some people are faded to go to heaven if they die unbaptized as babies. Some people are fated to go to the inferno if they die as unbaptized babies. And that is, uh, that is sad, and yet that is Dante's universe in this divine comedy. The punishment here I used to think was not much of a punishment, but now I disagree with myself. The punishment is to forever have desire without hope, which means you always want something and never get it. And I only just realized that this is actually based on one of the major three arch traitors or arch sinners of the Greek mythology. We'll call them from Tartarus. Sisyphus, Tantalus, and... Anybody remember the last one? I'd be so impressed if you remember the last one. The liver is eaten by two vultures, not one, yes? Wait, is it... No, it's not Prometheus. Not Prometheus, he's a titan, and he has one eagle or vulture eating his liver. It is Titus, in any case. Do you remember which character from last year, remembering both the Odyssey, uh, Book 11, and the Aeneid, Book 6? Which character forever is struck with desire for that which he cannot have? Fruit trees hanging above him, water below, starving and thirsty, being parched forever, yes? It is Tantalus. These people are forever tantalized. Desire without hope is truly a terrible thing, because what do you know if you have desire without hope? You will never, ever get what you want. It's like a depressed goth teenager or something like that. That's just against me, man. Flips hair. <laughs> In any case, I, uh, I, I like to think about this as, I don't know if you've ever had one of the, if, I don't know if you celebrate Christmas. Any of you celebrate Christmas? Okay, any of you remember when you were a little bit younger, let's say like 10 or 11, did you care about Christmas even more back then? Yeah, because you liked stuff. Well, you remember the days leading up to Christmas? You're off school, so you don't have a lot. You have a lot of time to just sit around and think about things. Like every day, you kind of wish it were Christmas, like a little bit more, a little bit more. Especially the years when you know you're going to get something good, like a bike or a new video game console. Everybody's feeling that a little bit. Okay, and you know how you get up to Christmas Eve, and you're like, man, I really hope. I, can it just be Christmas? Has anybody ever had that feeling? Or even at the end of the year, can it just be summer now? Has everybody had that feeling at some point? Can the day just be over? That's what you feel, and it will never go away. Ooh, terrible. ooh, terrible indeed. And that's, that's the context I wanted to give you. So, places here. We'll see the noble castle. We'll see some very famous philosophers and poets and uh, just general, in general, thinkers up there. And not just uh, pagan ones in the Greco-Roman tradition, but a couple Muslim ones, too. Averroes is there. Um, I think Saladin is there. He's a famous battle commander. Is that a question? Um, yeah, so, like, don't they know that they're never, like, with the example that you gave, don't you know that they're never going to get what they have desire for? They know they're never going to get it, and yet that does not take the desire away from them. And so, the people you need to know, very, very important, know the poets who welcome Dante into their ranks. They are the great poets, as far as Dante is concerned, the greatest. They are Virgil, Homer, Horace, Ovid, and Lucan. 
And probably on the quiz, I'm not going to ask for Virgil. I'll say, who are the four poets besides Virgil who will invite Dante into their ranks? And I just want you to think a little bit about that. There are also three major philosophers. Something I think profound is this. Homer, for example, has existed through translation, through transmission of text, copied by hand over and over again, over 2,800 years. In fact, he was lost for some time to the Latin West, while the Arab East continued to translate him from Latin into Arabic, and eventually it was translated back into Latin later on. That means that people found him profoundly important. In fact, we still have two of his major works that you all have read. Virgil became a school text immediately after he finished the Aeneid. He also died right after he finished the Aeneid. And it is somewhat unfinished, we think, because of partial lines in books 3 and 5 not quite being uh, as refined as the others. But his three works all continue to exist. His Georgics, his Eclogues, and his Aeneid. 2,000 years after he wrote that. Horace, we still have his Ars Poetica and his work on satire, his satirical work. He's a satirist. And Lucan, he wrote a famous work called Pharsalia on the civil war between Julius Caesar and Pompeius Magnus. Ovid, he got expelled from Rome, we think, because of his uh, Ars Amatoria, his art of loving, during the time when Caesar Augustus was trying to clean up the morals of his people. He thought that they were a little, a little vulgar, luxurious, lustful. And so Ovid supposedly then wrote a work that, uh, you're going to have to know this, uh, wrote a work that was all about how to seduce, and so he got banished from Rome until, you know, until he died. In fact, he wasn't actually, his banishment wasn't relieved, I think, until the early 2000s. And so it took about 2,000 years for uh, the Italians to let him back in. All this goes to say is that these are some of the most incredible minds ever to have existed, point blank. No argument. They continue to exist. Where are they for Dante? They're in hell. These are the guiding lights of the Greco-Roman culture. Is it enough to learn the Greco-Roman wisdom to make it to heaven for Dante, to live a good life for Dante? The answer is clearly what? In fact, I think you recall from your homework the other day that there's a very pithy quote that says, something overcomes all error. It is not wisdom, though. What is it that Dante says? Overcomes all error is the one thing that these people lacked. Anyone know what it was? one of the theological virtues. It's a very famous song about it. Have a little something in me. Have a little faith in me. Yes, yes, it's faith. That's the one thing they all lacked. And that's the reason they're in hell for all time. Socrates was, of course, the famous teacher of Plato, who was the famous teacher of Aristotle, who was the famous teacher of Alexander the Great. Their work still exists. I have Plato sitting back there. In fact, the reason I am a teacher is because of reading the Gorgias by Plato. And so, to call these guiding lights rotten fruits in the dead garden of the noble castle, and it certainly is a dead garden that parallels the Garden of Eden with living fruits in it, which we will see at the top of Mount Purgatory, which is itself based on the celestial garden that we will see at the top of celestial paradise, heaven, is a very powerful thing by Dante. And so I just want to mention that to you. Apparently wisdom, learning all the things you can learn in the world from the Greeks and Romans, is not enough to stay oneself from hell, to live a good life. Huh. Hmm. Moving on. Between circles one and two, we run into Minos as we start to approach true hell. I like this image of him by Gustave Dore from the 19th century because he, it's well drawn. The, you have the snake image going on, but there is one problem with it. Who knows what the problem with it is? He has feet. The problem with it is that the Minos that we know of in the Inferno in Canto 5, he has a tail, a snake tail. And so students often ask me, they say, Mr. Schmidt, why is it that this Minos has a tail? And I say, huh, it's the bottom half of him, right? It's the half you don't really see. We'll see this again. This, we'll see this image, this symbol, essentially rehashed with Gerion between circles 7 and 8. Well, a snake. A snake is something that slithers through the, ga the, the grass. It uses deception and camouflage to attack what it's going to kill. Well, so does a human. 
There's something you too have within you which is invisible and deeply threatening if you wish to use it as a weapon against someone else. And what is that? That's right, your mind. Your thoughts are invisible to people. They cannot see them. And you can use them to generate plans to do great things or terrible things. And so I think that that is an image for his discernment, his ability to judge where you go perfectly. And uh, just very interestingly, just to say something interesting, they do. Uh, there is an evolutionary uh, biologist named Lynn Isabel from UCLA who actually has done some research suggesting that uh, 60 million years ago, humanoid creatures fought for the trees against, can you guess what creature predated on them? Snakes. 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 And so snakes are a very prevalent image in, our, in almost every mythology that exists. You see a snake in the Garden of Eden. You'll see a dragon, which is a snake plus eagle plus lion plus fire. And um, uh, the, in Revelation, the last book of the New Testament, you find a snake slash dragon guarding a garden with golden apples on a tree called the Garden of the Hesperides in the Greco-Roman tradition. And, and on and on. You see, uh, you see snakes and dragons even in the Eastern tradition. <laughs> in any case, snakes generally here, though, are going to be sort of bad. You even see snakes associated with Athena in the Aeneid. Recall that two snakes do service to her by killing Laocoon. All right, cool. Canto 5, Circle 2, Lost. We focused on this during bell work yesterday, really analyzing the speech of Francesca uh, to Dante about her tete-a-tete, her, her, her affair with Paolo at the expense of her per poor husband, John. Here in Circle 2, Canto 5, the punishment is that the lustful souls are blown about in a violent storm without hope of rest. Something I don't think I've been clear on that I should have been is you should really imagine how horrifying an image this is. And you might even be able to make this using CGI on one of your computers. This is like a tornado or gale force winds. It's not like these people with like some wind sort of blowing them. They are being blown about in the air like a bag in a tornado. They are queasy, nauseous, and they are screaming, and the wind is screaming too. So it is loud here. And these people are getting horrifyingly pulled around. Imagine looking into the sky and instead of stars, people being contorted and twisted and pulled about. You'd look up there and it'd be horrifying. You couldn't look away. So that's what's happening. A great question asked, and the last period was, then how does Dante actually talk to Francesca? Apparently the wind stopped for a moment, she comes down, and so he can hear her, and she's stopped lo just long enough for him to talk to her. Yes? Can they, like, crash into each other? They certainly can crash into each other. They certainly can. Mm -hmm. Yes? Um, and with all the punishments, they never get used to them, right? They never get used to them. That's, what, that's the conceit you have to think about. They never get used to them. Because what allows you to get used to punishments, because you understand that they will end at some point. Their minds, you can learn. They can never learn. And so they are, per they are in a perpetual moment of, for of eternal torment. <gasps> Alright, good. Good, 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 good. You only need to write four here. A couple things to remind you of. The second circle is the circle of lust. Uh, the word we have these days, luxury, that is an old medieval word. Uh, and, well, actually, slightly after the Middle Ages, in the modern period, the Elizabethan period of playwriting, uh, uh, Shakespeare will use the word luxury to mean lust. But you can even see it luxuriosus in the Latin as well. Luxury means to be lustful. In any case, these are the sins of lust or luxury. They are fleshly desire. They're sometimes called the carnal desires. We know, being uh, from the sort of food around here in Escondido, that you can have carne. And we generally translate carne as meat. But a better translation of carne is flesh, like the German fleisch. These are the sins of touching things. Gluttony, the tongue, lust. Also many parts of your body. Things that are vulgar because they are just touch, not mental in any way. Um, Paolo and Francesca. Just to reiterate this to you, are the cheaters. Francesca cheats on her husband named Jean with his brother named Paolo. Do not get Paolo and Jean mixed up like she did. My goodness. 
And now we're going to run into a few other famous characters here. Dido, Cleopatra, Helen, Antony, and Achilles, Achilleus. And I'll tell you why Achilleus is here based on a medieval story about Troy that was not in the Iliad. The thing I want you to focus on is this. These people are not in the Inferno just because they were lustful, but because being lustful, even doing a minor sin, had major, major repercussions. In fact, I, each and every one of these people dies violently because of their lustful actions. In fact, let's go to them now. Yes? Just a real quick question. Apollo, was he married too? I don't know. That's a good question. I don't know if it was a double sin in that that way. I've never looked up whether he was married or not. I, I like that question. I'll, I'll see if there's any information on that. In any case, let's go quickly over a few of the people here who die violently because of their loss. Dido. Well, let's recall, she had made an oath to her dead husband, Sychaeus, that she would stay chaste. She would abstain forever from marriage and the marital act of conjugal bliss. Well, Aeneas rolls through. They hang out in the cave for a little while, and then they hang out in her room for a little while, and she has given up her vow of chastity. What does she end up doing? She commits suicide and violently hurts her people as well as herself. Yes. But it wasn't her fault, though, because... I agree. I agree. I, I understand what, where you're coming from here. She was accosted by love. But look at how Dante looks at this. Francesca said that she was accosted by love, but she still had a what? <laughs> she had a choice. Dante's perspective is that even if there is a God of love, which he would not accept, if it seizes you and makes you fall in love, it does not make you make the decisions you make based on that love. It does not make you cheat even if you wish to cheat. Yes? So if suicide can be considered murder, would she could have gone to like the lower circle? Great question. Suicide for Dante is considered violence against the self. So yes, she very much could have gone to the seventh circle. There is a specific subcircle for those who harm themselves, either their substance or their property. And they're, actually it's one of the more horrifying uh, punishments in the Inferno. The people like Polydorus from the Aeneid have grown into warped and wrangled, mangled trees. They can only speak when they are in pain, when... A branch is pulled off of them like Polydorus, and blood spurts out, and they can speak through gasping pain. And often there, and there are also filthy harpies above them that will rip their branches off occasionally. And so we'll get there very soon. We'll be there next week. Cleopatra. Something you should know about Cleopatra and Mark Antony, who are both here, Marcus Antonius. So Marcus Antonius was almost the first emperor of Rome, except at the Battle of Actium. See, he was in love with Cleopatra. Cleopatra was known for being uh, uh, quite successful with Roman dignitaries. She first was, uh, she would have said married, but I would say boyfriend, girlfriend, with Julius Caesar, had a child by him named Caesarion. Then she was Mark Antony's consort, pulled him from Rome down to Egypt, where he continued to live, even though he was a triumvirate, or part of the triumvirate, a triumvir in Rome. There was a major battle between Mark Antony and Octavian. Octavian won it and became the first emperor. Why did Mark Antony lose? Let me tell you. He had the stronger naval fleet, supposedly. And he wasn't even supposed to fight navally against Cleopatra because he had stronger infantry. In the middle of the battle, Cleopatra turns and runs. Her flagship runs for no reason. Mark Antony follows. His forces scatter. They lose. He is disgraced entirely. Commits suicide and utter disgrace. Because he followed the woman he loved when she, for no reason, left the battle that he could have won. And then she famously takes, takes two asps, two snakes, and has them bite her on the chest, and she dies of poisoning. Polyxena. Oh, well, Helen. I need not even say anything of her. Her lust cost Troy its existence. Polyxena. Did I tell you the story that Polyxena was a daughter of Priam that supposedly Achilleus fell in love with? And that... Achilleus attempted to have a, a tete-a-tete with her in a temple, but, and this reminds me of like a high school drama, instead of her showing up, her two brothers showed up. Save Phobos and Paris. And so Achilleus is showing up all happy, and then he gets shot with arrows and dies. And that is the medieval account of how Achilleus dies, which is why Achilleus is amongst the lustful, not amongst what we would expect. Who would you expect to see him around? 
Anger, of course. Anger! Sing of anger! Goddess, the son of Peleus. Achilleus. Yes, exactly so. And then there are a couple people who I don't know a ton about. I thought they were Troilus and Cressida at first. They're not. Tristan and Assault are these. It's Princess of Ireland, lover of Tristan. I do not know much about this story. I can only imagine that they fall in love and then they die for some reason. If I were to ask you about a Shakespeare story that sounds a lot like all of these people, do you know a Shakespeare story where two young people fall in love? One of them is as young as 14, and then they end up committing suicide at the end because it doesn't work out. Yes? Romeo and Juliet. Again, you're seeing the big point to take here is it's not just the act itself, it's the major consequences of the act. And I say this is a very important thing for people in secondary education to learn. The act might seem small, but the consequences are huge. This is, I would say, a development on a theme from last year, which is... Does anybody remember the big theme from Greek mythology last year? Yes? Nothing is as it seems. Nothing is as it seems, and that is part of this. You never get away with what? You never get away with anything. And the consequences can far outweigh what causes them. The effects can far outweigh the causes. Did I see a question? Yes. What circle would you put? Uh, I'd probably put him amongst the violent. I'd probably either put him amongst the violent or the anger. It would depend on Achilles when I was thinking about him. But yeah, probably either circle five or circle seven. Uh, five is anger. In any case, let's move on. Oh, yes, and of course Dante listens to Francesca's poor, poor story. And remember her story is that she's, she's reading, or sorry, maybe I'll, I'll do that for you. She's reading a story about Lancelot and Guinevere, and Lancelot was essentially the Achilles of the Knights of the Round Table. He was the greatest knight under King Arthur. Guinevere was King Arthur's wife. And, well, what happened? Well, apparently one day, after a long time, they, they, they saw each other, and uh, 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 Lancelot finally kisses Guinevere, and Francesca is reading this book with Paolo, and they see that Guinevere finally kisses Lancelot, and his lip trembles, and he kisses her, and it says, and no more reading was done that day. And then they end up down in the Inferno dead. So, well, there it is. Yes? Could you go back real quick? Backward real quick? Is that woman um, Francesca? Right that is Francesca. Is? That is Francesca. And this is Dante. Or, sorry, this is Virgil. This is Dante. <laughs> <laughs> He's already passed out. He's already passed out. This is Virgil taking care of him. Taking care of her, and she's looking all, oh, oh, everything's unfair. Oh, the king of the universe is unfair. Love is unfair. That book was unfair. My lack of chaperone, unfair. Yes. Wait, on the other slide before the picture, it said that they're, they're endlessly reaching for each other, but are eternally. Except for Francesca and Paolo, who are all together, who are all together, but continually ripped apart. Hmm. I don't know. In any case, Canto 6, Circle 3, Gluttony. I really like this image. This is by a very famous uh, artist rendering um, the Divine Comedy. His name is William Blake. He's considered very sort of uh, phantasmagoric, very different, odd. You see Cerberus there looking rather horrifying and also rather skinny and ravenous, which I think is very strong, uh, a very strong irony in the circle of the, glutton the gluttonous. Also, that guy who looks like a mixture between a pig and Jabba the Hutt, and is amorphous, that's Shiaco, and his name actually, that is one of the words for pig in Italian, Porco being another one. He is a pig man. That You need to know his name, because I'm going to quiz you on his name. In any case, what is the punishment of the gluttonous, those who overindulge in food and drink? Well, just as they lived as pigs, so do they live in a pig sty. They are enmeshed in mud for all time, like pigs, with raining hail, striking them, and occasionally Cerberus mauling them. I think there's another piece to that interpretation that would be, just as they overate, so are they overeating. Just as they were consumed with the desire for food, so are they literally consumed at this point. There's Cerberus being denigrated again by Dante, or by Virgil. Virgil here giving him uh, some mud to eat on. He, was, he received a little bit more when we saw him and had to pass him with the Sibyl in Book 6 of Virgil's Aeneid. I think, I can't recall whether it was a plant or not. I need to look this thing up, yeah? Yeah, honey cake. It was. It was something like a honey cake. Good. Good uh, memory. I need you to write the red and what's after it. Nothing else here. 
something we've been talking about um, through circumlocution, something I've been talking around but haven't given you the term for yet, is an Italian term called contrapasso. Contrapasso means to suffer the opposite. It is a term that reflects the relationship between sin and punishment in Dante's Inferno. There is a symbolic connection between every sin and punishment. Every sin should, or rather every punishment of sin, should make sense if you really think about the sin. And so here I just give you an example. Just as in life, they were consumed by their desire for food and drink, so are they consumed in death. Or just as they acted as pigs in life, so do they live or exist as pigs in death. You, do you start to see that there is a connection always? Uh, like the schismatics, the people that cause uh, fissions or fissures between people's relationships, families, politics, and religions, they will be cut open. Do you see the symbolic connection there? They cut people apart metaphorically, so they're physically cut apart. And Actually, one guy gets his face cut open. Every time he goes by a devil, one guy gets his whole chest. Actually, they are the founders of the Muslim religion, which shows you uh, the medieval Dante's perspective, uh, you know, living during the times of, uh, around the times of the Nine Crusades. In any case, do I need to say anything here? Write down Shiako's name and the fact that it says pig, and also recall this theme. Whenever Dante runs into an, a Greco-Roman, otherwise known as a pagan deity, god, or monster from Greco-Roman mythology, he will have Virgil essentially say, it is willed by God for me to get past you, you have no power here, indicating that the Greco-Roman religion no longer has power over the souls of men in a Christian age. And so you see that with Charon being commanded by Virgil, you see that with Minos, you see that with Cerberus, and on the next slide, you will see that with Plutus, and we'll soon see that with another cherry, uh, or cherry man, ferryman named Phlegias, and then we'll see it with some actual... Christian angels called the fallen angels. All right, here we go. This is going to be, we have two slides remaining today. We get to circle four. We see here in front of us Plutus saying in a nonsense language, it's not a true language, even though it looks vaguely Sem Semitic, Pape Sedan, Pape Sedan, all that. It looks like Father Satan, Father Satan, help me. But it's a nonsense language because he's full of nonsense. Because he does not seem to understand the purpose of language in the same way that the avaricious and the prodigal do not understand the significance of money. Avariciousness means to be greedy or to be miserly. Like Oscar Wilde says, a, a miser is a person who knows the cost of everything and the value of nothing. doesn't know the symbolic value of money. And well, we'll see that when I lecture on this on Thursday when I describe the punishment, which is very Sisyphean based on the second of the punishments we see in the Greco-Roman Tartarus, which is to forever push a, border, a boulder up a hill just to see it fall back down. Well, these characters are forever pushing boulders in a semicircle. The avaricious one way, the prodigal in another, and then they get into fights with each other. Which means that, well, we talk in terms of circles with metaphors all the time. If you've made a 180, you've totally turned around. But if you 360, you've gone full what? Circle. Circle. You have a full perspective. These people's problem is they just go the same path forever without seeing the path of others. Meaning that they are limited forever by their own perspectives and never get a full perspective because they don't realize the value of other people and the information they have to give them. They don't realize that other people have something more to them than a dollar value. Huh. Very, very interesting. Well, we'll pick up from that next time.